Okay, another version of, of this is the, the, the true analytic induction itself. And this is where the iteration comes in now. Uh, sometimes called explanation building. I think actually Yin refers to it as explanation building, but others call it analytic induction. Um, and the idea is to build up and confirm a set of causal links between events, actions, and so on in the case, in the setting we're looking at. So in this case, there is an idea of building things up, but we do start with a theory. We start with hypothesis, but we, we amend it and build it up and, and develop it, perhaps, and, and, uh, and change it. This is a, a, a typical kind of diagram of the analytic induction process. And what you do is you start with a rough definition of the research question. This is obviously, you know, any researcher starts here, a research question. And from that, you produce a hypothetical explanation of the research question. So some kind of hypothesis, some kind of prediction about what's going to happen. So-and-so will happen because so-and-so so, you know, in this particular setting. I expect this to be going on here. Well, there might be several of them, and it may not be one, it may be a complex of, of hypotheses that you want to look at. And then you go through case by case through your data, and it normally is case by case, and cases can be individuals, people you've interviewed, or it could be something larger, it could be departments in a company, or it could be groups of people, families perhaps, um, or it could be even events, it could be occasions on which something happens, and, and those could be the case, but a set of cases, and you go through each case at a time, asking it, asking rather, is it a deviant case? Does this case fit with the hypothesis? Is it, does it follow what I'm predicting in, 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 in this theory? If the answer is, um, this is not a deviant case, it does fit, and that's true of all the deviant cases, I can't find one anywhere, can't find any case that doesn't fit, then your hypothesis is confirmed. You can say, I've got my explanation now, I know what's going on here, and you can end your examination and write out your results. There you are. But of course, normally that's not the case. As we start looking at particular cases, we all usually find it's a deviant case. It doesn't quite fit. So the hypothesis is not confirmed. And then we have to ask, well, what can we do? Can we um, perhaps alter the hypothesis? Can we tweak it in some way to make the, the new case fit? And often that's the case. Often, you, you know, the, your original idea is, hasn't kind of allowed for enough different variations of things. And a, a slight tweak will say, yes, that's fine. Um, we, it will now fit. Um, if you can revise the hypothesis so you can exclude that case and you haven't got any other cases, then you've basically got your explanation and you can then stop the whole process. But if you can't do that, if you can't tweak it, you have to revise it. So you have to start again, in a sense, start to think of another explanation of what's going on here. And it may not be very far from the first one, but it might be a radical rethinking of things. You've got to come up with a new hypothesis that somehow includes the cases that don't fit. And then go through again and cycle right the way around and come back to the, the whole process of, of looking for deviant cases. And of course, as you reformulated the hypothesis, you have to look at all the cases again. The ones that were okay first time might now be deviant because you've changed the hypothesis. And that's one of the problems with this method. One of the problems with this method is that you end up with doing lots and lots of work. It is a very kind of a, um, um, a lengthy process to go through this iteration this way. But it does force you to do the things that I was talking about earlier on. So you are forced to look at every single case in the same way. You are forced to think about things in the same way, to be consistent, to be inclusive, and to be complete in your approach. So the iteration has advantages in that sense. Things that often qualitative researchers are um, tempted by, um, you know, leaving things out and, and, and giving certain things too much concentration, too much emphasis. This at least, this, this process can allow you to deal with that and, and not be fall prey to those kind of temptations. But, as I say, it is a, a lengthy process. And as I said, it's hard work. Um, and that's one of the problems with, with this approach, that it is, uh, it's a very intensive approach, a uh, lot of work involved in doing it, and doing it properly. But as I say, it does have the advantage of, of at least being complete. Other problems are that you might drift as, as you go through each iteration, you kind of forget what you were doing. And it's because you know, qualitative situations are quite complex and you can very easily begin to drift away from your original ideas. And you need to make sure you're not doing that. You are keeping with the original questions, the original research questions you want to ask. Um, 
It also only really establishes sufficient conditions, not necessarily ones. So you find this, this, and this sufficient to produce this, but we don't know if they're necessary or not. In other words, um, those things together will produce this, but maybe other things will produce it as well. They may be not necessary, um, they're simply sufficient. And we can't tell that from it. So it is a, there is a limitation on this kind of approach. And above all, there's no guide as to how many negative cases are needed for validity. You know, if you, you know, in a real world, you can't allow for every single case. You have to reject some cases as inappropriate or in some sense different. Um, and you, you know, you, you, you've no idea of what kind of level of, of those cases we can accept or not. So to make it valid, it, it's a very hard judgment to, to, to make. Okay, one or two other approaches here, which I've called structured approaches. Um, I just thought I'd throw this in because they are the same kind of sense of, of, uh, of a kind of a, an iterative approach. I just wanted to stress this one, um, which is a, a time series approach. I talked about time series approaches when I'm looking at quasar experiments. And I, I think I, this is where that diagram comes from. Um, and you can see this is very much a diagram associated with some kind of quantitative thing because it's high up here. Time, if you like, is going across the, the x-axis here and the y-axis is some other measure. So whatever it is, is high up here and then it suddenly drops down low here. And the, the, the time series experiment is that something happens here. We do some kind of intervention at this point, the midpoint, when suddenly it changes. Now, of course, in a qualitative sense, the same thing can happen, but it's a qualitative change rather than some kind of numerical or quantitative change. So rather than it dropping down like that, the situation changes from one qualitative, uh, one qualitative position to another at the appropriate point. So I see no reason why you can't do this kind of time series analysis. And again, this involves you in looking at a situation or a setting over several points in time and doing a qualitative analysis of it and then looking for this kind of change, not a numeric change like this, but rather a qualitative change at the appropriate point when the intervention happened or when something happened. If it's a quasar experiment, something could happen. So again, a, a repeated approach, but in this case, looking for that change over time. Problems are it may not have any clear start or end point. That's the trouble with qualitative data is that they are not you know, always that, 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 that distinct. Um, and, um, and one or two other problems too that um, um, we need to obviously be aware of all the kind of external threats to validity. Um, that, the, that the trend, um, you know, what's, what's theoretically significant might not be that the trend predicted before the research. And the last approach, which kind of bears a similarity to this, this time series approach, but which actually is quite common in qualitative analysis, is a chronological pattern, uh, looking for a, a sequence of things happening over time. So rather than a, a straightforward change at a certain point in time, we're simply now looking for things that, that in some way change at various points across time. And it might be they, they gradually change, or it might be certain things change at certain points in time, and other things change at other points in time. Uh, going on. Just to give you one example of this, I had a student some years ago who was doing a, a, a PhD study of families where one person in the family had a very serious life-threatening uh, illness. Um, one of the problems she had was that actually in several of the families that the person who was ill died um, during, the, during the study, so it was quite difficult to, for her to deal with and for, to get the data. But it was that, they were that serious. So, and the question was, how did the family adjust to this over time? And she actually went back over a period of two years, uh, several times to each family, to talk to the members about what was going on and how they adjusted to it. So a very qualitative study, interviewing people, but looking for this chronolog chronological change. So how did the relationships change? How did the, 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 the people's lives change? What, what, how did they see what was going on? How did they interpret what was going on and so on? So we're looking for all these kind of things, some events following others, some events follows others after a certain passage of time and so on, and looking for those kind of similarities, but not all at the same time, not at a single point like the, the time series approach, but rather maybe varying across different uh, um, things. And again, the idea here is that you have a standard set of things you're looking for in each of those cases, in each of those um, families in the case of my example. <coughs> 